So I got a quick question for you guys. I haven't really read through your forms too much. Um, uh, what did you guys come here for? What's the, what's the main reason? I know you came just to recheck things out. And I don't know what, where your goals are right now. I kind of I should have glanced at it a little closer. But did you come here for confidence? Did you come here about women? Did you come here about both? Did you come here for confidence about business? What what, what is it in particular you're looking for? First two. The first two. Right. Which first two. confidence and women. Awesome. How about you? Um, more so just the second one. The women. Okay. Awesome. And where are you at to these days? I've known Greg for like eight years. So. Yeah, we haven't seen each other in a while, but we saw uh, each other a few months ago. That's true, very yeah. briefly. Briefly, yeah. It's good to see you. Uh, I'm here to expand my consciousness, and I'm wearing uh, your person who's spent a lot of time expanding his consciousness, and I respect that. Awesome. Well, I'm glad to have you. And um, so let's let's get into it. There, there's usually a lot more people here, so it's kind of more intimate. So you guys just feel free to ask questions. I'm going to dive in and talk about a lot of different stuff. I got a little script here, but I'm welcome to leave it. I just kind of follow the basic principles. There's certain teachings in here I like to get across um, that uh, I think are important. And they're, they're the basic teachings of, of Fearless. I get a little bit into, uh, I can head a little bit more for, for you into some more energetic concepts, which I usually don't talk about in the basic talks as much, but they're there and they get a lot deeper as we go. I noticed you were looking at the Course in Miracles and I was curious why you picked that book out of the out of the out of the lot i'm curious myself too you know what it is um not enough i'd like you, some enlightenment that you guys uh, awesome hey, have you heard of it before you picked it up no okay it's a fascinating book it was a book that was um supposedly channeled in the 70s by a woman named helen i believe and she just started hearing voices in her head and uh, she couldn't get the voices to stop. She's a, she, she was formerly atheist too. Is what I yeah, she was a, a born Jewish and turned atheist, and um, couldn't get these voices to stop. She kept asking for proof that God existed her whole life. Couldn't, didn't believe that God existed. Kept asking for proof that God existed, and she started hearing these voices. And then, so she went to her boss because she was a professional psychologist working in a college. And her boss said, also a psychologist, said, "Let's just start writing them down." Let's see what's in your head, what's coming up, and then learn about it, and then maybe we can help you get these voices to stop. Well, it became a seven-year journey that became that book. Mm. Everything that she said ended up getting written down that book word for word, and it became this, this book that spread all around the world. That's amazing teachings. And she was told in, uh, by the voices, as you, whatever you believe, that she was channeling some information that they wanted the world to have. The book is an amazing read, whether you believe that or not. It's a very powerful book. It's been translated into insane amount of languages, and it's helped a massive amount of people. So it's interesting you picked that book. Yeah, it seems like that. What would you say is like the, some of the core messages? Um, What's the premise? How do you describe the Course in Miracles in the sum? That, uh, that a miracle, well, the basic principle is that a miracle is a shift in perception. All miracles are shifts in perception. Mm -hmm. They're, the physical manifestation of the miracle is only a result of a change of an internal perception. Once you change internally, the outside world changes to match your new internal perception, the way you see the world. So um, once your beingness believes you're phenomenal with women to at its core, women will be all over you. You'll see, you'll meet women like crazy. And they'll seem like, why was this ever difficult in the previously? I don't get it. It was so difficult. And now it's easy. It's because you've internally changed. It all starts with causes as always what's inside. So the book talks about that changing in, in, in the perceptions, constantly changing your perceptions to get your consciousness risen. And uh, it talks about how to do that. And it uses a very modernized version. There is a, you'll, you'll feel a very Christian theme to it. But it says it's not a religion. And it's, and it's talking in that language because a lot of people can understand that language in modern times. And so it's using that languaging, but it's to take, it's trying to strip all the dogma of any religion off of it and just be a teaching. So that's the best way I can describe it right now. There's a little thing that, that breaks down the whole course right in the beginning. It's a little passage, super short. And uh, I used to know it word for word and I forgot it. So, <laughs> but that's not what we're here to teach. So, sounds like a book that we could very much yeah, you'll spend, you can perspective. You can spend your whole life studying it if you didn't catch it. I mean, I could read from it, but it's like it takes forever just to break down a tiny little piece of it mm -hmm. and to digest it. It's a hell of a read. People spend their whole life studying that book. So many years. Um, sure. Sure. 
So uh, I want to promise you guys, first off, that you can be successful with women. You can be successful with building your confidence. You can be successful with money. It's all part of who you are. Now, the reason I know you can be successful with women is because you're men. Men are built to attract women. That's part of being masculine. So what we're going to take a look at today is why, if you're having trouble in this area, why you're having trouble attracting women when you're built to do it. Men have been attracting women since time began. Women are built to attract men. Men are built to attract women. And so we want to take a look at that. Now, have you all heard of the law of polarity? It's an unfailing law, right? In the universe. You know what it means? You know what uh, it means? Polarity. polarity. There's seven natural, polarity. yeah, there's seven natural laws that are unfailing laws. When you're having trouble accomplishing a goal, usually you're, if you look at the seven natural laws, you're probably out of alignment with one of these natural laws. And these are uh, not just spiritual laws. They, they would be laws that are just like in science, you would find them to be true. Law of vibration, law of rhythm, law of polarity is one of them. Um, law of polarity states wherever there's an up, there's a down. Where there's a left, there's a right. So you can't have a stick that's four feet from left to right without it being four feet from right to left. Everything in the physical world has a polarity. You can't have something in the physical dimension that doesn't have polarity to it. This empty space to exist, we need walls to define them. The walls of the polarity to the empty space. Does that make sense to you guys? One side of the wall is the polarity of the other side of the wall. So you can't have a male without a female. You can't have masculine without feminine. They are forever attracted to each other. And you are built to run masculine. 80, 90, well, 90% of men are built to run masculine energy, which polarizes feminine and draws feminine to you. That's an unfailing law. That's not spiritual. That's not anything. That's the natural law of the universe. Okay, so you're built to attract women. You also have a desire to attract women. And you can't have a desire without a way to achieve it. That's also a polarity. You can't have a question without an answer. That's also a polarity. So everything you want is there. The question is, why is it not coming into your life? Why can't you get the women? Why can't you get the money? Why can't you get the success? Why don't you have the confidence? These are the real questions. Because they're there if you want them. And if, but, but I want them and they're not showing up. Well, there's a reason they're not showing up. And that's what we want to take a look at. Okay? So, um, let's jump forward. Uh, just so you know a little bit about me, um, I take a very different approach to dating, to confidence, to men. Um, I've been doing this for a, a long time now, and um, and I've been studying. I've been immensely in, in in depth, kind of studying how the mind works my whole life. Um, it's been a passion of mine. I've never stopped. Why things do what they do, and one of the things I discovered early on, and I really started cultivating. And I think the reason that, that Greg's here now is, is that getting women wasn't as important to me if I didn't like myself in the process, if I didn't love myself as a man. So if I had to get to this place where I really believed in myself as a man and I felt inside I was just as valuable as the woman. A lot of guys, they're just teaching techniques to get women, but they're not dealing with the self-esteem of the guy. They're not dealing with the confidence of the man. So a lot of the in-depth stuff that I get into is because I want to not get, I've seen this too many times with teachers. They start to get women but they haven't dealt with their, all their self-esteem issues. And then, the, then they go into disillusionment and then they don't leave their bedroom for a while because now I'm getting women, but I still hate myself. I'm still not happy. So they end up getting a girlfriend that they don't even really like and they just stay with her and they become miserable. And when I saw that, I saw that early on in the teachers teaching in this industry, I didn't want to be one of those statistics. So I had to start deeply working on who I was being inside. And that's how uh, Fearless came to be, which before Fearless was called Inner Confidence. And, um, and so it was a big piece of, of why I do what I do. Okay. Now, if you work on the masculine and you work on the, who you are deep down inside, the women start showing up naturally. And not just like if you get women from this perspective of I want to get women to prove myself, the type of women you get aren't nearly as interesting as the women you get if you work on your confidence either. Because you're going to get women that match your level of confidence. And this is why people, guys that get women at that level tend to start losing faith in women because they're getting women that match them. So did you want to say something? By the way, these are all awesome concepts. Uh, what's very difficult, I think, for a consumer is to differentiate somebody who actually 
knows and has that inner confidence, right? Mm -hmm. A teacher, right? Mm -hmm. What's a question you would ask another teacher that might reveal that they might I look at false clothes it's, or whatever? It's not even a question to their being when they talk. Right. Like, are they reactive? Which we're going to talk. I'll talk a little bit about. Are they proactive in the way they communicate? Um, are they present when they listen? Um, really listen? Yeah. Do they look? Do they look at you and into you? Can they demonstrate this stuff on a subconscious level, or are they just rambling? You'll see a lot of the guys that are They're doing a routine on you, right? Exactly. So that's and, a good that's a good point. Exactly. You'll feel them rambling at you, and they're just blah, 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 blah. and that's what they do to girls. And they find girls that are at that stage of consciousness, and they kind of match up. And um, and when we get up here and do a little work on stage, if any anybody wants to come up, did you want to come up? Oh, I'll happily volunteer. If they I don't. How about you guys? Either of you guys want to come? Okay, it's a simple thing. I'm just going to have you come up to a girl and say hi. Nothing, nothing complicated. Okay. <laughs> so I just want to see how you, I, we really want to look at your subcommunication. I know his subcommunication is going to be, I got an idea what his will be. So I would like one of you guys, if you're interested to come up. Um, so a little bit about myself. I used to be extremely shy to the point where I would hardly leave the house as a kid. I didn't like talking to people. I was anti-social, didn't like speaking in stages. If you asked me to get up and speak in high school, I would shake and, and freak out, get up and get down as fast as I could. And then I would feel like I was going to die. So I had a lot to change. After I got out of high school, I realized I didn't want to live my whole life that way. Because I, if, I, if I lived my life that way, I was going to be miserable. And so I sold all my video games and my computer and my Dungeons and Dragons stuff and all that crap. And I decided to start working on myself. So right out of high school, I really started studying personal growth like crazy. I read every book I could find. I read every subject I could, I could learn about self-esteem. I remember the very first book I bought was called Feeling Good by a man named Burns. And, and um, a lot of his concepts kind of resonated with me right away. And I started applying them. I started immediately working on my self-esteem. And um, throughout the years, a lot changed. I started to understand a lot. But my life didn't change. It changed a little bit, but it wasn't changing fast. And that drove me nuts. And I would share some of the concepts because I had learned so much in my head. I had so much data. So I'd share these concepts with people and their lives would change a lot faster than mine would. And I thought that was interesting too. I was like, why are they shifting faster than me? And I didn't understand what was going on with me. And um, so I kept moving forward and kept learning. And I eventually went to a hypnotherapy college and I spent a year in hypnotherapy college studying the mind and, and, and how to slow the mind down so you could literally change your mind faster. And that's when it kind of hit me. I started to understand a little better why I wasn't changing. It wasn't to know so much the hypnotherapy. It helped. But the reason I wasn't changing was I was thinking too much. My mind was too active. I could calculate, crunch, think, analyze, all this shit. And I was stressed about all of it. So my, emotionally, I was always bound up inside trying to find the next answer and massive desire. And what happened was that energy in and of itself is what stopped me from integrating the new knowledge. Because you can't, I can't worry myself into a new way of being. I can't stress myself into a new way of being. If you're in this heavy energy, this stressed energy, it's going to be really hard to learn and process. And you can't, and so when you're overthinking, the mind starts to race and you go into what we call the spins. This is what most people do. They try to learn from the spins where their mind is just like a tornado and it doesn't work. You can't learn that way. Not fast. And so, let, for, so learning for me became a process of stress, 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 till I kind of surrendered one day, and then I'd have a breakthrough. Stress, 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 breakthrough. Stress, 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 surrender, breakthrough. What kind of breakthrough were you have? Just something would start changing, because I would study, 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 and I, finally I would reach this point where I, I, my brain was overloaded, and I'd go, ah, fuck it, I'd surrender. And that's when things would change. Right, right. And then suddenly things are, like, suddenly I'm like, oh, why am I different now? And I don't understand what happened. And really what I was doing was I was overloading the computer. And that's the same as hypnosis. That's the whole point of hypnosis is to get that, the computer to shut down so we can learn. But I didn't know that at the time either. So it was a lot of, a lot of data, man. I, my, I, I got a teacher years later and uh, he called me a data collector. He said, stop data collecting, stop data collecting. Because I had this supercomputer running up here that was like, I'm going to figure it all out. You know, I know exactly what that's like. It sucks, doesn't it? I know it? exactly what I feel you. I, I feel for you. I know exactly what you're so you do this a lot? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So have you read everything and studied everything? Or? I, yeah, over over the years. And mm -hmm. It wasn't only until you mentioned the video, I was like, oh, shit. Yeah. That's exactly what I've been doing. That data collection's a bitch. 
And it fucks us up. And, and it's why people, I would share it with somebody who's not per se a data collector. And they'd be like, that's cool. And they go out and try it. And they're like, that worked. And I'd be like, what the fuck? It doesn't work like that quick for me. And it's because I'm getting in my own way, tripping over my own feet. Okay. Um, and when you say you had a teacher who helped identify that for you, what kind of teacher was that for you? He was a spiritual teacher. He was a spiritual teacher that worked primarily in mystery school, uh, worked primarily with the mind. I was with him for four years, and it was a very intense study, very grueling, and he was brutal. And uh, he was not your typical, he was not what you would call a spiritual teacher, like, woo, 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 whoosh, whoosh. He was hard as nails, pushed me, like, hard in my face, pushing me for years. Um, and uh, that's where some of my, that's what, what got the basis of my concept started was the four years I spent with him. And then I kept evolving after that. Uh, before that, I had a lot that motivated me to go to the next level. Uh, I was living in a, yo I don't know if you knew this, but I lived in a yoga cult for a while. And I spent a year living in a yoga cult after the hypnosis thing because I wanted to change my life again. I was like, I just need a change. I, was, I had um, office jobs all my life and cubicles and I hated it. So I figured I'd move into this place. They said, come in, we'll, we'll feed you for a year. All you have to do is work in the healing clinic and help people and, and stuff like this and help us with stuff. And I, I was like, okay. So I moved in, not realizing they were actually a cult. I mean, I spent a year there, fascinating year of my life, saw all kinds of stuff. And I was madly crazy at the time about, I thought, I thought I'm a spiritual guy. I'll meet spiritual women. Life will be great. You know, they got all these yoginis there, these yoga chicks. And so I get in there. And I think I'm going to hook up with one of these yoga chicks. Well, nothing really happens in that area. They all start seeing me as a project to be fixed because I was so broken at the time. And then this guy moves in and he has no place to go because he just came out of prison. And so that he moves in, he takes a bunk bed in there because he has no job. He's on parole, has no car, has no money, has nothing. And uh, Daniel, and you guys can guess what happened with that guy. Every girl wanted him. Every girl was like, Daniel this, Daniel that, Daniel. And that's where I was like, okay. This guy's got something. I don't know what it is, but I want to know what it is. What is it about this guy, Daniel? Because I'd be standing there, I'd, I'd be repelling the women. He'd get near the women and they'd all be chasing him. He'd laugh at them, he'd tease them, he'd mock them, he'd walk away from them. He, he didn't, and, and they would just get frustrated, but then want them more. And I was like, so I pulled him aside and I actually said to him, I, I, I literally said, Daniel, what is it that you're doing? What is it that, that turns women on? He goes, what do you mean? Right. He had no clue. Yeah. He just said, I just talked to him. That's it. He was in prison too, right? So yeah. It must have been so fun for him. What an overload experience. What, the women? Yeah, yeah. right? Just been in prison forever, yeah. right? He's like, this is amazing. Yeah, he, he was in white collar prison, but yeah, he was in prison. He was in the prison. He was in prison with, uh, probably shouldn't say this on camera. <laughs> uh, I don't want people to know, but he was in prison with a famous celebrity and they were hanging out and that smoked a lot of pot and so um but it was cool uh he was a good guy um so i ended up moving in with daniel so the thought here my thought process was that i was living in this yoga community here's daniel i can end up hating this guy or i can end up loving him right i can end up liking him becoming his friend and so we he wanted to move out at a certain point and i wanted to move out so we ended up moving into an apartment now this guy had no job he was trying to start a business because he was on parole and uh so it probably wasn't the best choice of roommates but I really wanted to watch this guy and I knew he couldn't explain anything. So this was my opportunity just to be around the energy. I also moved in with this girl, Kat and Kat and Daniel and I all kind of hung out in this apartment together. We had a three bedroom apartment. So Daniel immediately gets on match. Now I couldn't get a date on match to save my life. He borrows the money to get on match, pays for a month of match. And he's got date after date, after date, after date, one after another. All, all, every, it, it blew my mind how fast he started getting dates. So I said to myself, I can't even get a date off match. I got to look at his profile. So I asked to see his profile and I read it. And after reading it, I was like, Jesus Christ, I'm attracted to this guy. I, I, and I asked him, I said, what did you do? Did you know what, what's in your profile? I mean, what, what was the conscious thought? He goes, I don't know. I just wrote it. I didn't even think about it. I just wrote the first thing that came to my mind. And so I, I, again, it hit me again. It's what I went back to, what I said in the beginning of all this. It was who Daniel was being. Daniel knew he was attracted to women, period, at the core of his being. He didn't have to worry about it. He didn't have to think about it. He didn't have to analyze it. He didn't have to work on it. It was who he was. And he said something very interesting to me, because most guys, if they don't have money in the bank, have a hard time getting women. We equate success with women with having some money at least, right? Daniel did not do this. Daniel said to me one day, and this was very true because he had no money, well, I don't have any money and I can't seem to get any businesses started because he's horrible at making money. 
but I can always have women. So I'm going to date. And he would get these women to take him out and pay for stuff and pick him up in their cars and all this crazy stuff. And so, again, my mind was like, okay, what is it with this guy? Now, since then, I met a lot of other guys that were naturals. They were amazing. Some not naturals. They built themselves. Two of them, Dave back here being one of them, that had lived in a van and, and just they lived because they had no money, lived in their van, party, picked up women all the time. And, um, and so I realized at a certain point, you can't use this. I couldn't, me personally, I couldn't use the excuse of no money anymore because money didn't matter. Three guys had shown me very clearly they were phenomenal with women with no money. Um, I'm sure at this point you've seen the other way too. Yeah, I've seen short guys. I've seen my clients come in here and blow my mind. Like they're short, tiny, overweight, not looking good. And boom, all these women, they, like, they just start going and it's like they get it. And it clicks. And they're be we call it the beingness. Their beingness shifts inside. And when the beingness shifts, like Napoleon Hill said, the riches, so much riches show up, you wonder where it was during all the clean years. Because, and so we're going to, so what we're really going to get down to is what is beingness? Because the beingness works with money, it works with women, it works with health, it works with everything in life. If you don't get the beingness part straight, you're always going to have to work hard to get what you want. Because you're going to have to state pump to compensate for the insecurities that, that the, once you have the beingness, it overrides all the insecurities. Okay. Um, so me personally, I, I, I went on this journey and I just spent a lot of time after I moved in with Daniel, I spent a lot of time just working on this area. I became committed because <clears throat> I, <clears throat> I didn't want to spend my life alone. So I became committed at uh, changing this part of my life. And so within a very short period of time, I met this girl and I thought, you know, I'll go on a couple of dates with her and that'll be it. And within two weeks, I was nuts about her. I couldn't stop thinking about her. And this is when I realized how below my self-esteem was. <clears throat> because when she wasn't around, all I could think about was what is this? What is she doing? Where is she at? Why isn't she here right now? I mean, I was obsessed with her. And um, when she was around, I just wanted, I didn't want her to leave. And I'd never had this feeling with a woman before. And I realized she was the first girl that I ever dated that I chose that chose me back. And so the other thought that was coming up all the time is how long until I blow it? When am I going to lose this girl? It was in the back of my mind. I could not get that fucking thought to stop. And it took me, I think, two months to blow that out of the water like nobody's business, right? Um, you guys all read the game? Oh, I can't say this on camera either. Okay, because it's somebody's name. Um, I don't want it going out into YouTube land. But I took advice from somebody in the game um, who told me, because I'd been making a lot of friends of all the dating coaches and all the, the famous ones. And I took advice from somebody in the game and um, blew the fuck out of that thing. It was not good advice. <laughs> and uh, ruined that really bad. And But what it did... No. In terms of the timeline, how are you connected to the other folks that were doing dating coaches? Were you taking classes at the time? Not, Not at the time, no. Okay, so you just I, I, I made know. friends with a few of them through, uh, through, because I was a hypnotherapist and I taught and I went, approached them not as a client, but as a hypnotherapist and I, I did some, and, um, and I was learning from them, learning some interesting stuff, but it wasn't, ser it wasn't totally serving me because it didn't match my personality. It was a very, uh, egotistical machismo yeah. controlling uh, being a bit treating women like and it was it just didn't work for me um but i tried it and i learned and grew from it what was the advice that you took that blue what is that it was something i was supposed to say but it was being very it was very i can tell you the energy of it it was very harsh and very forward and very demanding and very controlling and it just didn't match who i was and um <laughs> and she was a, had a little too much self esteem for that kind of energy, so that was my opinion. You need you need to, those guys are constantly testing for girls with those self esteem they can control. Um, and so I blew that out of the water, and so I spent about two months depressed, and I didn't function well at all for the next two months. My roommates hated me; they didn't want to be around me. And um, then I <clears throat> then I went nuts. And I came out of it and I said, I'm going to change my life now. I'm not going to have this low self-esteem my whole life. I can't live with this. So I went out and I actually started taking dating workshops at that time. And I said, I'm going to learn from, I, I looked up all of them and I picked one I thought would be good for me. And I started, and I took it and I took their second one, two weeks later and I spent like 5,000 in two weeks taking workshops and, and uh, flying and, 
And the next thing you know, they hired me to learn to be a coach. And so I became an assistant coach because I was already a hypnotherapist and a coach. And I started just learning from them and then helping out at the workshops, learning from them, helping out at the workshops. To be clear, at this point, you still didn't consider yourself having an abundance. No, but no, no. But yet no. you were coaching others, right? Uh, they, what they did was they would have us just kind of hold people's hands and take them out in the field and why somebody else coached. Right. And so, uh, uh, yeah, at the time, I don't think, I think a lot of the people that were helping weren't qualified, but that's how a lot of those companies work. But what it did was I started learning and processing. I watched everybody. And some of the guys there were, were really good. I can remember a few that were pretty good and I'd watch the way they would be. And I watched the way this person was being. I watched the way that person was being. Next thing you know, they're flying. I started rising up the ranks and I'm flying to London and I'm flying different places. And now I'm starting to actually get pretty decent and things started to change. Why? Because I was applying myself a lot. I was really working hard and I was really studying and I was really applying, but I still had a lot of insecurities. What I realized what I was doing was doing a lot of state pumping to compensate for my insecurities. Does anybody know what state pumping is? Okay. So I was state pumping the shit out of myself because I come in insecure and I have to get myself all pumped up. Boom, now I'm ready. And then I'd be kind of crazy out of my mind with Red Bulls and vodkas and stuff like that. And it would work. But then there was the next morning, the next week time, and it starts to wear on you. You can't live your life that way. And so that's what, bore, what eventually grew in our confidence and grew fearless was this whole idea that we got to start working on who we're being on the inside at a deep level. Otherwise, that's the only way you're going to succeed. And that stuff doesn't work. I tore my gut, my, my body up. I really burned my body out doing that. And I needed, a, I needed to take some time off to heal my body. It wasn't good. Um, you know, I had, a, I had really bad intestinal damage, things like that. So I don't recommend that route. Um, cause it was a lot of pushing. I already had bad, uh, uh, stuff going on in my intestines. I didn't know it. And I started drinking all those Red Bulls. Actually it was a uh, rock stars. And I started drinking all those rock stars. And next thing you know, my body was just not having it. Okay. And, uh, I actually caught, I, I, I got bad thrush. I had a uh, blood in my throat. I had blood in my urine once. It's, so don't recommend that route. If you go that crazy. Um, so I, took the, I spent a lot of time reinventing myself. And even after I met you, I took another year off to really just work on my mind and who I was being. I spent that year going deep inside, doing a lot of deep work. And it really changed my reality massively. I'd spend sometimes eight hours a day changing beliefs, just working on myself. Because I came from, I came from poverty. I came from a lot of really low self-esteem. I came from a lot of problems and emotional problems and money problems and all this stuff. And I had to change all this. And since I was so low on the emotional scale, living down in depression, apathy, and grief in the beginning, and I had to climb out of that, I was climbing from the bottom up. And uh, that's why I think I'm good at teaching a lot of this stuff, because I started down here and I climbed up, and my life is pretty amazing now. I you know, just got back from Japan, just traveling a lot, so forth. So I want to say that you know it's a, it's a journey for some people. And on my job is to cut the, the length of that journey way down. It took me years because I had to really dig in, work with different teachers, learn stuff. I had to experiment, fail, and I didn't understand how simple it could actually be. And I, now, even now, I'm getting to understanding. Even every month, I'm understanding more of how because I never stopped learning of how simple it can be to, to make the changes. But if you're doing the analytical thing and you're beating up and analyzing and you're getting really heavy with the topic. That's the slow process, man. That's hard. It's hard shit. You do not want to do that because your body has a pain pleasure principle. You guys hear about this? It's really obvious when you say it. Pain is worse than, than pleasure. Is good. Well, the, the, well, the body, the mind, the, the nervous system always is trying to push out of your, your experience anything that it perceives as pain, even if it's good for you. And it's always trying to pull into your experience anything that's pleasure, even if it's bad for you. For example, drugs can be bad for you. But because the drugs take away the uh, make you feel good and the body perceives it as pleasure, it gets you craving the, the drugs, right? So the pain pleasure principle is really a, a simple principle. So if your learning is painful, trying to adopt new knowledge and new ways of being, and all you're doing is creating emotional pain around it and frustration, the nervous system is going to go to work to try to get that stuff out of your life. So it's not going to make it easy for you to learn. Because if you learn it, you're going, to, you're going to adopt more of the behavior that it perceives as painful. And so therefore, it needs to get you to fail. This is why learning becomes really hard. It needs to get you to fuck it up. Okay. 
Does it make sense? Connecting? Yeah. And so that's the, the body will go to work to make it hard for you to remember things, to learn, to apply, to all kinds of stuff. Because it's like trying to get you to quit, man. Because this is dangerous. What are you fucking doing? Girls are dangerous. Look, this is bad. Bad news, you know, whatever it is. And, uh, and that's the pain and pleasure. And so that keeps you down low on the emotional scale and apathy and grief and fear. It keeps you frustrated and nothing changes. So that energy, that, that whole cycle has to shift for you to start learning fast and start enjoying the process. Okay. So I want to promise you that you can be confidently confident, powerful with women. You can do all of that, but you got to approach it from the right perspective in the right direction. Um, and, uh, Hey Anthony, what was your experience in this area? Cause when you first started, you were pretty scared, right? Yeah. You were numbed out and scared. I remember. Your eyes used to look like you were stoned, even though he never smoked any. He didn't smoke anything. <laughs> He'd swear to him. He'd swear he was stoned all the time. And um, After, um, doing, um, like just working with women and doing approaches and all that stuff, it starts to get excited. Yeah. It starts to get fun. Like the, the nervousness and the fear, it just, it just, it's crazy. Like the nervous, nervous, the nervousness and fear that you feel the good, it starts to get like instinctually just exciting. So yeah. We'll talk to a girl. It'd be more like, I want to see how this is going to go, as opposed to like, okay, let me let me try it. Let me try with this girl. Let me try it. Let me try to do this with this girl. It get, it get crazy excited. So even now, it's like, it comes very easily. So when I talk to a girl, it's just like, and you guys you start yanking back and forth. Like, mm -hmm. that's fun. Yeah. I'm actually enjoying that when I'm being scared and I'm super nervous about it. Yeah, he's, he's going to eventually be a coach. He's doing great. He's learning like crazy and he's really loving it. He's loving the whole process and appreciating it. And he's, you're not just applying it to women, you're applying it to business. You're applying it to all kinds of stuff now, right? Yeah. yeah and, and so I really respect Anthony's, um, uh, uh, the way he approaches it because he really takes it seriously. Um, so that's, that's the number one thing is, is, is you, you, you got to shift that reality. And so, um, it's very easy to, to want to fight the uphill fight, but there's, there's much easier ways to do it, you know? And so, um, so number, the next thing is we got to understand what makes a, um, an attractive man and understand what it is. And so the most attractive men that polarize women are grounded, solid men that can create containers, right? And you guys, does that make sense to you? Or does that foreign to you? A lot of men today aren't this, so it might be foreign to you. A lot of men today are in the middle. They're not grounded, solid, masculine men. They're not because society has taught us to be half masculine, half feminine, not feminine in the, in the girly sort of way, but feminine in a passive, relaxed, flowing, I'm going to go with the flow sort of way. What is masculine energy? If, if, if the feminine energy, picture feminine, describe feminine to me. What's feminine? Damn thing. Dancing, okay. Passive. Passive, could be passive. It might be active, but in a different sort of way. But it, dancing is definitely true. It could be passive. It's a lot of flow to it, right? It's, uh, it goes with the moment. It's like water flowing wherever it can and just playing and dancing and play. Do you understand what I mean? This artwork is feminine. It's the expression of art. What's the masculine part of this painting? The frame. Exactly. Yeah. The frame allows the artwork to express. Without the frame there, the painting falls to the ground. So the feminine can't express itself without masculine to support it. Okay? So if you have a river and the water is the feminine in nature, the river banks are the masculine. The river banks are still, they're guiding, right? They're containing. Why the feminine is trying to go everywhere. If it didn't have the riverbanks, it would just go everywhere and dissipate. Okay. In a tree, the tree trunk is the masculine. It supports the tree, the leaves, the branches, the expressive, the part we see first and really usually notice first. You don't walk down the street, see a bunch of trees and notice the tree trunks first. You usually notice the, the flowing of the branches and all that, right? That's the feminine. So feminine is always the expression and the masculine is always the structure. When you go out, and you try to play in the middle and you're not, you're kind of passive and you're kind of fluid with women. They can't be the feminine for you. They don't, cause they don't have a support system to be feminine for you. If they want to get attracted to you, what do they have to do? 
they have to be feminine, right? So you have to polarize them into their feminine. When you show up masculine, penetrating, containing, creating a structure, a safe space for her, she immediately can drop her masculine because she feels your support and that you've got the, you've got the environment taken care of and she can become feminine. If you're the container of that environment, she becomes feminine for you. And that's attraction. Does that make sense? And that's in, that's in the nutshell, but too many guys are terrible at that. And it's simple. It's a way of being as a man. Now picture really masculine men. Who are they? Give me, a, give me somebody in that you can think of that you would call masculine, maybe in Hollywood, because it's, that's the obvious, right? Who's somebody that would be masculine? <clears throat> the Rock. The Rock. Okay. Does he manage the environments he's in? Does he contain? Does he lead? Does he take? His name is The Rock. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's, let's move it to the next level. What about in life? What's a person, a famous person that's maybe an athlete or a famous person that in any other form other than actor? Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan. Does he like, does he contain? Does he lead? Does he manage the, the space he's in? Right. Do you, you see him doing all that? Okay. Attractive man, isn't he? And you can see women liking him. Okay. Take, um, what's a job? Give me a job. that's like that, that women, women love cop is a great example. A lot of women really have, there are certain women that are cop chasers, right? But a better one I think is firemen. The women, fucking the fireman calendar, fire truck goes by, they're like, ah. And what does the fireman do? The fireman can, he runs into burning buildings selflessly. He has to stay perfectly conscious and handle these difficult situations and make, and without getting, and, and, he's, he's, and he's protecting the lives of himself and others in the process. He puts himself at risk to do this. Is he doing all that? Is he managing a situation, containing the environment? He's doing all that, containing the fire, saving lives. That's the epitome of the masculine to a woman. And that triggers attraction in women like that. That's why when women see fire trucks, they're all excited half the time, you know. Oh, there's firemen, there's firemen. Because for a woman, attraction isn't as much looks as you think. It's energy. It's who a guy's being. This is why little tiny guys can pick up women really well. Fat guys can pick up women really well. Because if they're emoting these energies I'm talking about solidly, women get attracted. They can't help it. It's, it gets triggered naturally. And they're, they move from, let's say they're half masculine, half feminine too, but they move from that energy right into their feminine in the presence of, if they're naturally feminine. There are some women that small percentage, very small percentage that are naturally masculine, just like there's some men that are naturally feminine. But the majority of women will move right in. But if you're living your life in the middle, half masculine, half feminine, which is what most people, men and women, are doing today, it's going to be really hard to attract women. We didn't used to do this. Men used to live in the masculine. Women used to live in the feminine. Modern society has created this. It's not a bad thing because we're creating an evolved man right now. We're in the process. We're in the second stage of a three stage process. It's going to create a more attractive man and woman than ever before. Who's the we? Oh, I say the, when I say we, I'm talking about the planet. Humanity, As, right? Yes, yes. That's a big idea. Yeah. Big idea, capital B. Yeah. We are in phase two of that. Yes, primarily. I would say um, uh, that this, I'll give you these, the stages. Now, the stages start out as first stage is uh, I'm the masculine, you're the feminine. I, it's my way or the highway. Get the fuck out. I'm the king of the castle, right? And the guy might really love his wife, but he's going to control everything from his masculine perspective. And you're going to have dinner ready at this time. We're going to do this because I'm the man. This is my house and we're going to lead it. And I'm going to lead it. How long has level one been going on? Level one, probably yeah, first. That's level one, right? I'm telling you to do something, do this thing. Well, I think I think that stayed. Caveman, right? But I think it's gone on long beyond caveman. I think only around, um, I guess, late 1800s, early 1900s is when we started the shift. Women started it. Women started to say, "I want the right to vote. I want the right to own property," which they should have. I'm not so disagreeing with that at all. <laughs> they should have. <laughs> And I, don't, I don't know if we disagree with that. Yeah. So, but they, uh, some people hear me say that and they're like, well, you want us to go back to that? And I'm like, no, no, it's not at all. And, uh, and they, and they wanted the right to, so they started saying to men, what? I don't need your masculine. Cause they were kind of fed up with being controlled. 
That's my way or the highway, okay? So feminine in the first stage, what was, what's their power? What's their tool? Like men have, we have force, right? What's the woman's power? Seduction. Seduction. The master of the subtle seduction, okay? So back then, she's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use my sexuality to get him. Like, I love him, but I'm going to use my sexuality to kind of control everything to get him to buy the new this or get a new car for the family or do this or I'm going to withhold some sex, right? And that was kind of the energy. In the second stage, now, an extreme version of this for a guy, I always like to talk about the extreme versions. One, you can have one version where the guy's doing it out of love and the woman's doing it out of love. They think if they, she can control him a little bit, he can control her, we can create a really happy relationship because I really care. They can still love each other. But you can also have an extreme version of this. The bad boy that's, a, like, say, a biker or a gangster uh, that's, uh, a, you know, somebody like that. Um, the extreme version of the feminine might be a gold digger or a prostitute or somebody like that that's using that, that energy. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay. So we move in forward to the second stage. Women start claiming their power. They start saying, I don't need your masculine. I want compromise. You need to work with me. And we can start, that starts taking us into the second stage. Men don't know what to do with this because women aren't accepting their controlling behavior anymore. So what's happening? Men start to flow more. Hippie movement comes along. Men are like, I'm going to sit back and smoke a joint. I'm going to just, you know, hang out. And, and this whole energy starts to get collected. Now we come to modern times and we're all half masculine, half feminine, which is good because it's not as good for attraction for you guys and for women either in that sense. But it's good because it's leading us to the next stage. You guys are starting to, you guys are, are a, a breed of men that have more access to feminine than any other man's ever had. Women have more access to their masculine than any women have ever had throughout history. This means you can understand women better than, you, than any man ever has. This means women can, if they, if they can start to understand men more. So this is going to create a greater process of understanding each other. But attraction back, we need polarity back. So how do we do that? That's the third stage. That's what fearless is all about, helping you guys step into that third stage. So third stage is when the men start to reclaim their masculine, but they don't shut off their feminine. They still have act full access to it when they need it. They can relate better to women. They can feel women better because they can feel all the emotions. They can see the subtle. They can feel the subtle. But they step into their masculine like a left hand or right hand by choice. I choose using this hand more. And if I need to, I can switch to the other hand. Same with women. Women start choosing being the feminine, at least in their relationship. She might go to work and be the CEO of her own company. Step into her masculine, run that whole company. She comes home. She wants you to grab her, kiss her, throw her over the counter, and take the masculine so she can surrender into that feminine for you. She can be, because she, her, her nervous system needs that in her relationship to be healthy. Just like his nervous system needs a period of being the, the penetrating masculine with a woman to feel like a man, to feel healthy, to feel solid. And if the situation permits, you two can switch roles. And she, if there's something that she's better at being the masculine at, you can switch roles and then you can take it back and vice versa. If you're sick and she needs to handle something, she can handle it. Vice versa. Do you see what I mean? That's the stage we're heading towards. That's the third stage man. How far away do you think we are from third stage? Uh, there's, a, there's third stage guys out there now. They're just not common. Mm. So we're right there for anybody that wants to go there. The question is, is do guys want to do the work that goes there? Because if a guy solved me in the second stage and I ask him to go start being a container, penetrating, uh, start taking the lead, start saying what needs to be said and, and ground her out and watch the reaction, starts, it's going gonna, it's gonna to scare the shit out of him. He's going to be like, what? You want me to say what? You want me to do what? And he's going to be like freaking out inside because it's, because it's going to require the next skill that we have to develop. And uh, which is the skill that the first stage man had and we lost as the second stage. Okay? And that skill is what I used to talk about a lot, which is uh, the ability to step into tension. You have to do it at the same time while feeling it. The first stage man would step into tension and not feel emotion. He'd just be like, oh, I'm tension. Third stage man has to feel all her emotions while stepping into tension. So when she's sad, he feels all her sadness and he grounds it and he contains her. 
at the same time as he steps into tension. It's a different energy. And he stays in that masculine while feeling all that, not being engulfed by the emotions and losing control to it, but feeling them all at the same time. So that's the skill we're developing. And that's why it's scary to step into tension. If you're a guy that can't feel a lot of emotion first stage, but is really good with tension, then it's easy to step into tension. Come here, I want to talk to you. Because if she rejects you, fuck her. You know, I don't feel much anyway, so what does it matter, right? You know, but the third stage guy, come here, I want to talk to you. He feels everything. And he learns not, he learns to ground it out and not take it personal. And she pulls back and he feels that subtle pullback and he just sits there with it, letting her know he's got it. He's right here until she relaxes. Ah, there, she relaxed. And then they move together in time, feeling each other. So he's leading from connection. He's leading from that depth of intimacy, that depth of feeling. It's a different type of guy. We'll draw a different kind of woman too. Um, and so that's, that's what we're ultimately missing. So I kind of covered all this, didn't I? So, um, so a lot of guys today, second stage guys are terrified of tension. They're terrified of stepping into it. They're terrified of taking action in it. This is why the guys, a lot of guys today have trouble making money, have trouble being successful in their fields. Tension is scary, but men are built for tension. If you look at anybody that epitomizes the masculine, they're all good at stepping in attention. Look at the fireman as he was stepping in attention. Is he dealing with tense situations? Look at Michael Jordan. Does he go out and deal with tense situations? Right? Look at The Rock. Does he, he, every movie he's ever been in or wrestling match or whatever, he's dealing with some tension, right? That is the domain of the masculine. And you can see it in these guys. And every guy you love, you go to a movie, and you go to see an action film, that's guys love our action films and stuff like that, masculine, right? Is the guy stepping in attention? Is he first, like, he's got all this tension to handle, he doesn't know how he's going to handle it, and then somehow he gets into it, and then he deals with it, and he comes out the other side, and you know, oh, I'm victorious. That's the whole story, right? Every woman, every movie that a woman goes to see, romantic comedies, it's all about emotion, stepping into emotion, feeling the emotion. A guy's scared of the emotion. He's got to step into it with her. And you see the difference there. And that's what guys are missing is we're not stepping into tension anymore. We're actually, in modern society, taught to avoid the tension. Get your nine to five job and don't take any fucking risk. Here's your nine to five job. Here's your, you're going to work on your retirement. And, uh, and now you're in, let's say you're, you're in your twenties and you're like, I want to go start a business. What does everybody say to you? Don't do that, dude. You're going to, you might screw it up. You might lose all your money. And then you're in your thirties. You want to start a business. Oh, now you got, you know, what are you doing? You're crazy. Like you're, you're, you're in your thirties. You should have done that in your twenties, you know? And then, then you got kids and you want to start a business. They're like, you can't do that. You have kids. You see what I mean? And this goes on and on and on. And so guys aren't living a life of purpose anymore. They're not stepping in attention. They're not taking risk. And you see why women can't be attracted to them? Because they've lost the sense of purpose and drive. They're penetrating energy. Every time you're stepping in attention, you, it's like you're penetrating. And you're creating something out of the tension and you're bringing it into being. And that's how why David uh, Data would say you're fucking the world open. And that's what you need to do as a man for women to be attracted to you. You got to fuck the world open. And if you're afraid of tension, you can't fuck the world open. Yet we need it. We crave it. So what do we do? We go watch sports because we watch other people experience tension. Michael Jordan on TV doing his thing with basketball. And we're like that we get our tension through him or go watch an action film. And then we come out wanting to learn martial arts and do all this stuff. And that lasts for a day or so. And then we kind of let it go. Does this all make sense to you guys? Yes, I have some questions. Mm -hmm. um, so what about a very success? I totally see that uh, mm -hmm. as a frame. Are women who are very successful, like somebody like Hillary Clinton, are you saying they're tapping into masculine energy? Yes. Yeah, okay. So they're just Look, at Bill's more feminine than Hillary. Right. Well, I think that's so they're a reversed couple on average. What would you say, I, so I totally buy that, what would you say about guys that are naturally... Uh, have abundance of girls that are like artists, like John Mayer, who's not traditionally masculine, right? Mm -hmm. Or somebody like John. He, he's got a, He's this. He's more in that heading, more in that third stage direction. Okay, you take my friend. I have a friend, Christian, is like that. He's got a lot of feminine, but he's got masculine where it counts. 
when it comes to leading, grabbing a woman, telling her he likes her, being penetrating, he does all that masculine stuff. And he's got access to all the feeling. So he's heading more in that third stage direction. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. And so uh, women get attracted to him because of that. There's a lot of women out there that have a lot of masculine and feminine. So they can really appreciate that. It's the thing that he's doing, and there's a seducer type called the dandy in The Art of Seduction. So you read this. And he's a mixture, a really nice mixture of the masculine and feminine. But he's got masculine where it counts. The points, the leading, containing, and all that stuff. And so that's what makes him attractive. But he's, uh, but you know, women love it when you have some access to your feminine so they can relate to you, you can relate to them, you can see art, you can see beauty in the world. Just like uh, it's fun to have a woman that, that loves to get dirty and go play in the mud and go, you know, jump, jump out of airplanes and stuff like that. You see what I mean? But you just don't want her to be, if you're really masculine, you probably don't want her to be constantly outdoing you in the masculine, just like she, you, she doesn't want you, like a John Mayer, to constantly outdo her in the world of art. Like if she's going to go out and be your beauty and get dressed up for you, she doesn't want you competing with her in that level. So she spends an hour getting ready, making herself beautiful for you, and you spend an hour and a half, she's going to be very frustrated with you. <laughs> okay? He hasn't got his hair right. He's taking longer than me. He's competing with me to be the feminine now. Okay? So she's, uh, she doesn't want that. Mm. Mm. So that answer your question? Good. Um, so we really need, as guys, we're craving masculine. But then we go to step into the masculine, and the feeling of tension that comes from stepping into it starts to make us feel like, oh, my God, i got to back off. See, we've been taught by society that stress is bad. That we that that, that uh, security and comfort is the main primary goal of the middle class, right? What do they tell you in the middle class? That get get to get a good job, be safe, don't take any risk. But in that, you're not developing your masculine either. Now you're you're developing this nice, comfortable, safe middle class life. It's not sexy. It's not powerful. It doesn't lead for. It doesn't lend itself to a powerful life. It doesn't lend itself to growth. Everything on this planet grows from tension. Is there anything, you can't learn something or have an experience in the physical world without tension applied. You need the tension, yet we're avoiding it. We're taught stress is bad, get rid of the stress. Don't step into the stress. Don't, you're gonna hurt yourself. There's a great study by a woman named Kelly McGonigal, and it's a TED talk, it's 17 minutes long. How to Make Stress Your Friend. Has any of you seen it? It's uh, How to Make Stress Your Friend. And she talks about it. And she's a health psychologist. And she said she spent her career teaching them that, that stress was bad. We need to get the stress out of your life. And she realized that that was wrong when she saw this study. They studied 8,000 people over 5,000, 10,000, no, 30,000 people over eight years. I'll have to double check the number. It's a lot of people, thousands over uh, many years. I think it was eight years. And they, um, they asked them, do you have a lot of stress, middle stress, or low stress? Low stress, middle stress, high stress. Or do you have, and do you think stress is good for you or bad for you? At the end of the eight years, two groups stood out. The group that had a lot of stress and thought stress was bad for them had the most illnesses, most failures, most challenges, most problems. Pain, pleasure principle, right? Right here is the pain pleasure principle in action. The group that had a lot of stress and saw stress as good for them had the most successes, best health, most gains of all the groups. So the stress they realized was not the problem. The tension was not the problem. The belief tension was bad for you was the problem. Pain pleasure principle. Because your body perceived all that tension as bad, it broke, everything broke down because the body was trying to get out of your life. And the body perceived it as good. Somebody like Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? He loves tension. You will watch his documentaries. The guy loves tension. He's like, ah, I love lifting weights. I just get one with the bar. And then he talks about in his documentary, I'm coming all the time. I'm coming when I'm curling. I'm coming when I'm crossing the street. He's just like, I want to be the governor. I want to go do this. I want to be a famous actor. I want to go everything. He just like, he couldn't wait to do the next thing. He was, and you see what I mean? That's a guy who loves tension. And look how we smile at the thought of being a guy like that. Right? It just excites us, right? Going out, doing it, stepping into it, making it happen, because that's part of what drives the masculine. 
The masculine grows through challenge, guys. The feminine grows through praise. Nurturing. So, make sure I covered all that. Um, uh, it was interesting, too, because in that study, Kelly McGonigal talked about how the body's response, the heart's response, literally the heart's response and the capillaries to the stress and tension. And um, she said that when we thought it was bad for us, there would actually be a closing less blood to the heart. When we thought it was good for us, the people that thought it was good for them, their hearts would actually open more. Oxytocin would pump into the body and they'd actually get better blood flow to the heart. It was actually better for their hearts and their overall body. And that's why they got health gains and things like this. Because there was a whole different relationship to that part. Does that make sense? So it's, it's, it's really interesting how it's our mind really controlling everything and our beingness. So a man that's great with tension just gets more out of life. He, Richard Branson is another great example of that. If you haven't read Losing My Virginity, read that. He fucking went right into tension all the time. His whole life from childhood, his parents taught him, don't give up, keep going. And he got praised for it all the time. So he had this relationship to taking risk. It was insane. And that's why right out of high school, he went from nothing, you know, never going to college all the way to a billionaire. And he's worth about $7 billion today, owns his own island, if you don't know who he is. And um, insane. And he, his, his mom lives on the island with him. It's this tropical <laughs> island they have, and she loves it, you know. She's the one who got, she took him, when he was like 10 years old, she took him 50 miles from home, dropped him off with a sack lunch and his bicycle and said, find your way home. She was teaching him how to, to deal with tension and step into it and go for it. And she encouraged him. She wasn't being mean. That would be called child abuse today, but she wasn't doing it to be mean. She encouraged him to do it. Yes. Yeah. And uh, he came home. He, he made it home. It took him two days. The first day he stopped at like his cousin or his aunt's house and spent the night. And then he continued on and made it the next day. And, and uh, it was he, stuff like that that his mom was always putting him through to teach him to step into it and go for it. So when he became a businessman, it was always like, let's go for it. Let's go for it. Let's do the next thing. And that's how he built the whole Virgin Empire that he's created today. You've seen Virgin Airlines, right? That's all Richard Branson. You know, and stuff like that. Never went to high school. Never went to college. Just started right. While he was in high school, he started his first business in high school. And that became a successful business. That, and then continued on from there. Um, so um, a man that's good with tension has a different relationship to women. Now we're going to start getting into the beingness level. Who you're being. A man that's good with tension has a different effect on women, on the feminine. Why? Because, well, let's take compliments, for example. Have you ever given a compliment to a woman and it just fell flat? You're like, she's like, oh, thank you. And just kind of walks off. How's that feel? Doesn't feel too good, does it? You can feel it, right? You can feel when it happens. Have you ever given a compliment and have it land when she lights up? Okay. Why do you think that some men can give out compliments and women really receive it on average better than other men. Other men give compliments and women are always like, thank you, whatever. What's the difference there? Because you, some guys swear, I've met guys that do this, they swear from the pickup community, oh, don't give girls compliments, that doesn't work. You gotta, you gotta nag them, you gotta be mean to them, you gotta do this, you gotta, right? Especially don't give a beautiful girl a compliment. That's a great signaling device. That's another way that that's a good one. What's that? If you need to bring down another person yeah. in order to win psychologically, this there's, is not good. There's a problem. It's not a good idea. There's a problem in that, yes. Exactly. I get when people are playing and teasing and they're having fun together. Well, that's, a that's, that's a whole different thing. So why is it that compliments don't work for some guys? Because yeah. of their beingness. Were you were going to say? I was going to say, is it not from a genuine place or is it from a nervous place? Or it's from not a from an anchored place. Yeah, so it is from a nervous place usually. So if I am ungrounded, like you just said, not anchored, and I give a compliment, and let's say I'm standing there and I'm like, not, I'm not containing, I'm not penetrating, I'm not feeling you, I'm not present with you, and I'm like, oh, you have really pretty eyes, I just you know, want to tell you. And do you feel that even that, Right there, not very grounded. Can you feel that difference? Uh, it means the compliment we give all the time. It's nice to meet you. Yeah. It's a fake compliment, right? That's right. not really. But if you said nice to meet you. 
Oh, I, you try this out. Thing. Try this exactly point. Try this out with baristas at, at coffee shop. When you just walk up, and instead of saying, hey, how's your day? Just get randomly, look them in the eyes, hold it, sit in the tension. And when they look at you, go, goes, how's your day going? And oh, actually mean it and hold that tension. Like right here, how's your day going? And sit there and let them feel you. They usually, oh, this person's actually talking to me. <laughs> it's a big difference because most people don't. Because you feel the difference when I looked into you. That's tension. You feel that tension? And so that's the whole point. So if I come over and I say, I really like your eyes. Do you feel the tension in that? I do, yes. And that tension is, is really important. If we're avoiding that tension, we're avoiding feeling, or it's all tension and we're avoiding feeling any emotion, that's a problem. So even tension can be too much. If I'm like this, all tension, hi. Oh, that's really, right there. <laughs> you feel that difference? It's, it's, it's huge. And so there's this balance. And you feel the give and take of it all in everything we do. That's what we mean by being this. Who am I being before my mouth opens? Who am I being when I look you in the eyes? And I, I, mean, I, I walk up. If I come up too solid, it's a little too much right there. If I relax a little bit and start just taking you in and feeling your emotions in relationship to mine and say hi, there's a whole difference in energy. And that's, that beingness is essential. And we don't get that beingness right. We don't get it when we're dealing with money. We don't do it, get it when we're dealing with women. We don't get it when we're dealing with sex. We don't get it when we're dealing with our health. That beingness is off because we're too busy worrying. I'm sitting here thinking, does she like me? Oh my God, I hope she likes me when I talk about the eyes. Like, oh, you got really pretty eyes. Hi, you know, oh, does she accept that compliment? I'm more concerned with what she thinks of me than enjoying her. And she can feel that difference. We have so much. Taking compliments. Exactly. This is somehow a reverse compliment. Yeah, and it's the same, it could be the same exact words, same exact handshake, same exact, but the beingness has changed and it changes the whole effect of the conversation. Because if I can't enjoy her and I'm trying to take from her and get her to like me, she feels every bit of that. We don't realize how much she feels all that. We feel it. We don't even realize how much we feel it because we're not conscious to how much this affects. We have micro expressions that go off in fractions of a second. We have so much subcommunication, it's ridiculous. So when you're making a deal for money, let's say you're a salesman. We were looking at a salesman today where I was, I was with Yaz, we were at a car dealership. And the salesman comes up and he was, and we were talking to him about something. He was getting so frustrated trying to get her social security number out of him so he could run her credit. He wanted to get run her credit. And so and he was just so frustrated, you could feel it. And I was like, he, well, he's not the sales manager. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why he's not the sales manager, he's getting frustrated. And I said, watch, he's gonna bring back the sales manager and watch the difference. And here comes the sales manager and he sits down calm, centered, hey, asking these questions, flowing. And you could feel the difference. Ah, oh, much easier to talk to. That's why. And you could feel the beingness difference and the way he asked for the, 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 the credit app. And he asked for that, you know, that's why he runs around being the sales manager all day because he's got all that beingness stuff down, that solidness and the smooth energy. And it felt really good to talk to him. And, um, and he was saying way less. The other guy was trying to convince us. The sales manager's like, oh, don't worry about it. I got, I got people. I got deals. I think we can, you know, I can call some certain people. We can make stuff happen. He's not saying anything to me <laughs> other than I'll call certain people. And, <laughs> and I'm watching this and I'm like, but he's so much more smooth than the other guy. And, and still, he didn't give me any more information. Didn't give you guys any more information. It was interesting. I love watching that stuff. It all has to do with your subcommunication. And so this is what everybody's missing out there. Here at Fearless, we focus heavily on subcommunication. And we focus heavily on you enjoying it, which is a piece that we've added a lot since then. Is how can you start to enjoy and first start to witness and then enjoy the subcommunication and the way you communicate with people. Enjoy the exchange of tension. Enjoy the exchange of vulnerability because that's what makes you powerful as a man. Your ability to lead all of that. She'll give you a lot more emotion than you need to bring because she's feminine. She's going to bring all this emotion. But if you can't ground it, contain it, lead it, you're of no value to her. Because if she, to, for her to fully be a woman with you, she needs to go into her feminine and surrender her masculine to, to you or to a man. And if you can't contain that feminine, she's going to go find a guy that can. If you can't channel that feminine, she's going to find a guy that can. So it's not about money, it's not about height, it's not about looks, it's about your ability to channel these energies and to be the picture frame. Go ahead. 
how do you temper that whole perspective of the guy just giving solutions when she just wants him to vent in that type of direction of that's being too sort of like, that's neediness that's wanting he's trying to fix her that's not being grounding does the picture frame try to fix the picture just holds it up lets it express the way it wants to you don't have to do much once you got the beingness right your job's easy and we always want to fix everything. We don't need to fix. The picture frame is not trying to repaint the painting. You see what I mean? Just believe in her, that she can handle it herself and ground her and contain her. You can handle it. And if it's something she needs help with, that's different. Like, you know, like, like we went to the dealership and my job was to ground her and I'll handle some stuff if it, if it makes sense, but I'm not going to try to, the, the key is we try to take people's, as men, we are often trying to, we think our part job is to try to take people's lessons away from them. And you got to ask yourself, is this something she's going through where she's learning and growing? And am I trying to fix her and take it away from her so she doesn't have to experience it rather than support her in her handling it herself? You see, and that's much more appreciated usually. Does that make sense? If you, but if you're, her, if you're like being the frame so she can handle it better herself and believing in her and saying, you can do this. I know you got it. That she can really value. So you can be like, this man's got my back. And if something does go wrong and she says, I need you to help me with this, I help her. That's different, right? But most of the time, she still wants to do it herself. She just wants somebody to believe in her. You know, and that means a lot. Okay. Um, did you want to say that? Got this interesting look on your face. Everything is true. Okay, good. So... It all comes down to enjoying her emotions. And see, so here at Fearless, what we're, trying to, what we're doing is teaching men to be this third stage. How to ground, how to be in touch with your emotions, and how to enjoy it, enjoy the process. We do get into a lot deeper concepts as, as we go along, but that's, that's the basic principle. Um, and so we, we do a, a, a lot of work, and we're going to do a demo of it here, but we do a lot of work in helping you guys to facilitate this process, this change in this process. Um, the ability to ground women. The ability to handle their tension when they, because they're going to, do women have a lot of emotion? That's the vulnerability part. If you're, if you're shutting off from that emotion, it feels horrible to them. But if you stay open, even when she's angry, that feels good. At least she can get into it with you and you, you can stay connected. And to be able to handle that and appreciate that energy, if you don't stay open, how long does the argument last? <laughs> it keeps going and going and going, doesn't it? If you stay open, it oftentimes moves really fast. And you guys all want to shut your hearts, close down. Is that stonewalling? It could be, yeah. It's a good way to put it, yeah. Like I'm going to be... Picture the two types of arguments with men and women in movies. The one where the guy shuts off and they, they're constantly butting heads and they're just fighting, fighting, fighting. It's not going anywhere and she's getting madder and she, he's a dick. And then the one where they're fighting, but he's open, she's open, and they're right in each other's faces, and the next thing you know, they're in bed having sex. Right? What is that about? It's a whole different energy, isn't it? And you can see those two different types. You can feel one sexual tension's building, and the other one, nothing's building, just frustration. And uh, that difference is huge. One is you staying open, the other is you staying closed. And so we want to pay attention to that. It all comes down to energy, guys. It all comes down to who you're being. If you want to shift that beingness, you're not going to do it through routines. You're not going to do it through lines. You're not going to do it through techniques. You're going to do it by shifting your nervous system at a core level. What's going on inside there? What's going on inside there? What's going on inside there? Getting that nervous system to proactively respond to the environment differently. So we have a thing. We call it proactive reactive. Proactive guys feel tension, walk into it and enjoy it. And so they're in time with the tension, working with it and they enjoy the process. Reactive, which is most common, feels the tension. They don't like it, but they got to deal with it. So they try to rush through it as fast as possible to get it done. So I drop something and I'm embarrassed because everybody looks at me and I'm like trying to clean it up as fast as possible. And I'm nervous and you can feel that nervous energy come off me. It's not sexy. You drop something, everybody looks at you, you own it, you feel it. You're like, now I'm just going to deal with it. And you pick it up and you do your thing and you're solid in your process. People are like, yeah, that guy's solid. And an example, you know, you can see this all through communication. Somebody comes at you with a little bit of tension. Do you get reactive and nervous or do you get proactive and step into it with them? 
and bring it to the next level. You see this in movies and sexy scenes in movies. The girl brings tension, the guy brings tension, the girl brings tension, the guy brings tension, and it raises and it builds because they're both being proactive. Usually at some point, the guy will bring a little bit more tension than the girl can handle and she'll snap. She won't snap bad, she'll just back up and then he'll back up a little. And then they have this moment of just rapport together where they're just enjoying each other. And uh, that's the match because he demonstrated this powerful masculine and, and, the, and she surrendered in that moment. Does that make sense? And that's what we're talking about. So if you want to learn this stuff, definitely um, we get, I'll talk about that later. But uh, that's what we do. We do a lot of remodeling of your nervous system to be able to handle this stuff better.